Hey everybody, this is Jorge from the Big Band Podcast. Today I am joined by Nico Adams. Nico is a product manager and senior research scientist at Data61, where they work on industrial internet and internet of things. Hey Nico, how are you? Hey Jorge, doing well, thank you for, the, for having me on. That's awesome. Um, so talk to me a little bit about um, with your job at uh, Data61. So Data61 is, um, is the digital business unit of Australia's National Science Agency, which is called CSIRO. Um, <clears throat> we're a very uh, broadly set up agency. We do research from everything across uh, um, agriculture, uh, food, and, food and nutrition, material science, uh, space science and astronomy, and also, and also di and digital cuts across all of these things. Uh, within our digital business unit, we've got 1,100 people just focused on data science research. So that makes us actually one of the largest data science organizations in the world. And data really is uh, to be understood as an ordering principle here. So we do everything from sensors, uh, from sensor engineering to developing uh, sensor platforms to developing, you know, middleware systems, analytics, um, UX and UI, we've got a very significant engineering team whose job it is to productize some of our research outputs. And uh, we also do work in cybersecurity, trusted, trusted computing, and so on. There's a, there's a whole raft of things, as you can imagine. Within that, I'm a product manager, and I specifically look after our industrial internet activities and um, internet of things in general. Outstanding. Now, what, um, what is this eye manufacturing or Internet enabled manufacturing. What's this internet enabled manufacturing? It's um, we've done we've done a lot of uh, work in Australia to try and understand what the role of um, IT in general is in manufacturing companies in Australia and the IoT in in particular and how Australian companies are thinking about it. And what we found is that um, um, Australian companies on the on the whole have issues getting their head around, um, you know, the business models that operate around the industrial internet, around the, um, the, um, uh, the, 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 the digital strategies that they might, might have to in, engage in to, to, to leverage industrial internet appropriately. And so eye manufacturing really is a concept and a strategy that we've developed for information driven manufacturing to a system um, with, you know, the adoption uptake and and utilization of these technologies. Uh, the the oh, idea see. behind eye manufacturing really is to integrate all the functions of manufacturing using a, using a digital thread that runs through it. So integrating the, the digital design of an object together with the materialization of the object, the, the control around the materialization, i.e. what happens in your factory, and then also with the business processes that operate around that. And really that's the integration of these functions through that digital thread is in a nutshell what eye manufacturing is. Wow, now is, is this already in is this already in play or is still just uh, research? No, this is this is uh, this is at the moment at the concept stage because as you can imagine we um, to actually get this going we almost need to we need to manipulate innovation ecosystems and that is a that is a big job. So this will take some time to build. Um, we're not the only ones who've come up with um, these sorts of concepts, if you uh, look at what the Industrial Internet Consortium, for example, is talking about in the in the manufacturing space, they they, they, they have very similar ideas there. But we're okay. all sort of roughly at the concept stage at the moment. Because right now, right okay. now we're still well, wrestling with, with getting industry 4.0 or industrial internet to companies and that further integration is then the next step. So this is a very long time horizon. Okay, that's very interesting. Well, you know, what is what is the what is the Internet of Things? What's the Internet what of Things? What is it? What is it? There's, the there's a lot of um, <laughs> that's right. definitions. <laughs> yes, that's right. And um, the one of the many definitions that there are, um, the one that I probably like most is one that um, McKinsey came up with in a, in a in a report they did in 20, 2015 around the the Internet. I think it was um, you know. Um, Internet of Things Beyond the Hype, the report was called, and they, and I've actually made a little note for this, and so forgive me if I read this out, but their definition is 
Sensors and actuators connected by networks to computing systems. These systems can monitor or manage the health and actions of connected objects and machines. Connected sensors can also monitor the natural world, people and animals. And that's a pretty, in my view, pretty good definition. So it's really the notion is that almost any object we can think of in the world is going to be connected via to the internet. It's using the internet as a com uh, uh, communication platform. That object, within, that object within it will have sensors that can sense information about the object state and also about the environment around the object and how the object interacts with the environment and it can autonomously then communicate using the internet as a communications platform with other objects that do the same thing. These objects can start to autonomously regulate their behaviors and, and that's, that's sort of roughly what I understand it to mean. Okay, I now ideas. why why do we want <laughs> why do we want everything to be connected <laughs> um because it's it's it it uh, creates very significant advantages and and, and 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 efficiencies many many things in the world are at the heart information problems um and you need information to solve them so internet of things fundamentally enables a number of if you will business outcomes that we all that we all sort of benefit from it, for example, enables better visibilities into factories and into supply chains. And what if you have better visibility into supply chain, what flows from that is you can actuate it, the supply chain better, you can control it and regulate it better, make it more efficient. And that, for example, means you can get better, you know, just in time manufacturing delivery, you probably waste less food that spoils while it's being transported. Um, you can create better customer insights, which then in turn leads to the ability to have more personalized and tailored products if you're, if you're, if you're an end user. You can better control your resource usage. It's, it's great to have to use less petrol in your car, less, less fuel in a factory, less, uh, less energy. Better health and safety outcomes, wearables, patient monitoring, telehealth, these are all sorts of applications that flow from that and of course as I said, customized services and products. So it's relevant to pretty much everything and everyone that we do. And um, the value add um, that's ex that the IoT is expected to add to the uh, 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 global e economy is in the many trillions uh, over the next 10 years. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've heard a, I, I guess it was a conference of Fortune, 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 Fortune magazine conference where uh, Tom Chambers, the CEO of Cisco, uh, was saying that there's like like 70 billion connected devices probably coming in the next six years or four, four years. Yes, um, and that would that that's going to be like a. I mean, we never live in a world like that. <laughs> no, um, indeed. And it and it's also got and it's not just got advantages. It's 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 also got downsides. Um, I mean, internationally, cyber attacks are. On the rise, and and you know, the more connected we are, the more we have to uh, to deal with that. I mean, just a, a couple of months ago, there was an issue in the states when uh, cars cars got hacked. Um, the, the car was actually connected through to the internet through the entertainment system, but that allowed a hacker to get in and, in essence, drive the car off the road. Um, so when you have connected medical devices, you know, then it becomes a very very serious issue, and so on. And we also have to think about, uh, you know, from a consumer perspective, what it means to, to own a device still. If you take, you know, a case again a couple of months ago when, so after Google uh, acquired Nest, um, yeah. Nest had, had a product called the Revolve Smart Home Hub. And uh, Google decided a couple of months ago to retire that Home Hub and to permanently disable it. And so, yes, you have the object in your house, but it has no functionality. So what does it still mean from a consumer perspective to actually own yeah. an object. These are things we're going to have to grapple with. Now, how does a, how does a business manage, you know, such, such a, um, I don't, I'm just, I mean, just, just uh, running with an example here, like in, like in your, in your case, an industrial company, mm -hmm. how do they manage uh, their devices? <laughs> you know, all these manage? devices that are connected. How does that oh, work? Let's say G, let's say GE uh, General Electric. Just thinking out loud, one company that comes to mind. Um, they have all these different businesses, but various, 
you know, you got turbines, you got, <laughs> I mean, they're all over the place, appliances and whatnot. So mm-hmm. how does a, how does a large scale business that gets into the internet of things manage that business? So how do they manage? How do they manage the businesses? Is, is is a different question from how they from how they manage the devices. Um, how they manage yeah, no, the, the devices? devices. And how to, yeah. How to do that? How no, to do that? At, no, that's all right. I mean, I mean, how to do that at scale? I think is is uh, is uh, is one thing that that still has to be worked out, largely. And I okay. don't think there are any. I don't think there are any good answers to that right now. Okay. Now, yeah, the, the, the because the other the other question that comes up after that is. Um, obviously, having so many things connected, yeah. um, we, we already have the good example of social networks, so we got more people connected now than never before, Yes. Um, yet we still have so much information, but I think uh, we, don't make a, we don't do a good job of you know, f- you know, analyzing that information and making sense of it still to the point where it's highly effective. Now we connect all these devices. Correct. It's more information, and I, you know, you were saying about a, an information challenge. So yes, we have more right. information challenge now with more devices. Yes, what, that's right. What's, and you know, what's going on on that front? Right. Th- yeah. That's right. And so, I mean, there, there are. Let's look at this both in terms of the consumer space as well as as well as the industrial space. In the consumer space, what you currently have is you have got all sorts of products that. Are being turned into quote smart products, and that simply means they get connected to the internet, and they've got a sensor or two in them. And <clears throat> for some, for some, uh, why that might be useful is immediately obvious, such as such as for fitness trackers or, or smartwatches. Um, when you start to talk about internet connected kettles and and, suit, and 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 suitcases, then 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 maybe the use case becomes a little bit more tenuous, and the. The point though here is that what we're currently doing in the consumer space is we've got a whole bunch of, if you will, IoT silos. So each one of these systems is an IO, self-contained IoT silo. And going forward, and that speaks to effectiveness, but the real value is going to be when these currently disconnected IoT systems start to interoperate and start to exchange information to really optimize scenarios and situations. Um, make, uh, Again, McKinsey, in the same study that I alluded to earlier on, they they reckon that about 40% of the value of an IT, IoT system going forward is going to be determined by its interoperability with other systems. And that's a, that's a huge thing. And that's ultimately what we have to arrive at. When your washing machine starts talking to the power plant down the road and then decides automatically when to switch itself on, then you have then you have efficiency and then you've got value at merely being able to turn on and off your washing machine or your kettle from a smartphone app while you're lying in bed is probably yeah not, it's not that much of a proposition it's like a it's like a gimmick but <laughs> but i i would i would guess that like for the like like the example you posted the the nest the nest example i mean obviously you want to know if if um you know <laughs> there's 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 something fishy going on. The thing will will tell you. You send you a notification to your phone. You know, bam, right? That's great. But <laughs> or something like that. You know, you don't want to. You want to know how much how much energy you're consume you're consuming you're using. Oh, absolutely. These are examples and, that are they're very efficient. Yes, absolutely. And 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 this is and this I'm going into the. Um, there's also the link going to the um, going to in, going to the industrial space now. In the industrial space, um, what the IoT is going to do, it's going to very profoundly change um, business models. So if, for example, I, I'm a manufacturer of air conditioning units, today I make and sell air conditioning units to, to you. Tomorrow I will make a contract with you that I will keep your house in a certain temperature range all year round. What that means is I will come into your house and I will I will, I will, I will, uh, you know, do an energy audit of your house. I will put in insulation when necessary. I will also put in the air conditioning unit that I continue to manufacture in there. But you're not paying me for any of this. What you are actually paying me for is that service of keeping your keeping your house in a certain temperature range all year round. And 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 if you think about what that takes, it takes it takes sensing. I need to be able to understand the state of the house. 
Um, I need to be able to understand the state of the environment around the house, whether it's hot or cold, the sun is shining or whether snow is falling. And then I need to respond to that and I need to actuate. And ideally, I do that remotely without the consumer even being involved in a certain, in a certain pre temp temperature range. And so really, this is, if you, if you take the meta level up from that, that is actually really where the IoT leads to different forms of both value creation as well as value capture. So when you make and sell a product now, then what you're actually doing is you're solving for an existing, for an existing customer need in a sort of reactive way. You have a guess of what it is that you know, a customer needs, you produce it, you sell it, that's it. Um, in an IoT world, that changes, that changes to, to trying to address customer needs in real time, probably using predictive, probably using predictive analytics. So coming to systems integration and again a consumer scenario, um, say my system in the cloud, let's call it Skynet. Skynet knows that I like to have a cup of coffee when I come home, when I come home from work. My car is connected, it, it knows where it is as I approach my home. Skynet turns on my coffee machine, typical IOC, IoT system. So predictive analytics, real time, real time response. If you think about the offering in itself, the product as it currently stands is a standalone thing. You make it, you sell it, and over time it just gracefully decays, if you will, and, and, and its use becomes less and less. With connected products, you can do things like over the air, real time, real time updates, and you can keep adding value to the product. And, and, and finally, if you think about data in that product, uh, well, right now, the, the product, as we've already discussed, is sort of a single point of data. Even if, it's, even if it's an IoT system, it's a sort of standalone silo. In the future, it's going to be that interoperability that's going to be useful. And this is just on the value creation. And so now, if you think about the value, the value capture end, um, you know, uh, right now, quite often, if you make and sell a product, well, you make and sell a product, and that's your profit and that's a profit right there. In the future, you'll be able to wrap services around products that give you a recurrent, 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 a recurrent income stream. You have different control points and you can you know, uh, develop you know, capabilities differently. Sorry for the long lecture, but that's... No, no, that's, that's, it's that's, awesome. That, this is amazing. An to your Listen, a lot, of, a lot of people don't understand this. Um, Kind of because it's so. I mean, it's, it seems so complex, uh, but you have to like drill it down. So my next my next question to you is, as just, let's suppose taking your example a little further. Yeah. Let's suppose there's a company that makes uh, refrigerators or whatnot. Yeah. And you know they want to they want to move into a strategy of the IoT. Yeah. Um, what are the steps they have to think through to to from to move from a product base? Uh, provider to a services business model. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, first of all, first of all, it's really, really important not to start this from the technology, not to start this from the technology side. Sorry, my colleague was just gesticulating. <laughs> I've been trying to get my attention. Not to start this from the technology side. It it is actually just good business sense. It is, it is, it is trying. It is trying to understand what the business outcomes are that I want generate want want to generate for my business. Who my customers are, what the value propositions are that I am to make to my that I am making to my customers, um, to have a digital strategy, to understand the business models that operate around these value propositions, and then you try and figure out whether and once you've understood all that, you try and figure out whether IoT has a role to play in delivering this because fundamentally IoT is always an enabling technology; it's there to generate business outcomes. So. Never, never start the question of, you know, how do I, how do I get into 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 IoT? That should always be the second question. The question is, how do I solve my customer's problem? How do I create a gain for my customer? How do I remove a pain for my customer? Oh, uh, actually, not. And, and, and once you understand how to do that, then you determine whether you map the IoT to it. Now, then, if you map the IoT to it. And, and you come to, to the conclusion and you say, yes, IoT has a role to play in this, then it becomes a different problem because then, then you need to really understand how to get started. And um, that, for a lot of companies, um, can in itself pose, pose quite some challenges. So if you 
again, I've done a lot of work in the manufacturing space, so I tend to look at my experiences in manufacturing. So forgive me if I choose yet another manufacturing example. But um, I, I, I recently read in, or well, recently, a couple of months ago, in Wired that, um, you know, uh, uh, manufacturers of, of bathroom, bathroom furniture, toilets in particular, are starting to think about turning themselves into healthcare providers by putting sensors in the bottom of the bottom oh of the God. toilet. <laughs> Because and, and if you think about it, it makes a great deal of a great deal of sense. Because if we've got sensors there, then I can tell you whether you know you had too much to drink the night before, or whether <laughs> you may you may have an infection, or whether you're pregnant. All these all these sorts of health outcomes. But if all your experiences in manufacturing so far has been in, in molding and shaping, in essence, porcelain, and then and then selling it, then turning yourself into the healthcare provider all of a sudden means you need to become. Uh, capable in developing sensors for the things that you want to sense. Yes. Then you need to become a software developer because you need to be able to, you know, make sense and, and do something with the data that you sense from the sensors. And you need to deliver it to your to your to your uh, to your clients. And you need to become an electronics engineer. And that is a very significant transition for a lot of traditional companies that want to get started. And so then the best way there really is to is to try and start up start up bottom up again try and understand what the business case is and how with minimal cost and in a very lean and agile way to prove the business case and then to scale from there okay that's good um so we talked about the business models um you know what what um you know there's a lot of industries you mentioned manufacturing there's also automotive energy farming you know what yeah. other industries uh, that are less talked about, um, you know, in the media or whatnot, are interesting cases of you know using Internet of Things. So I don't. Um, so I don't think there's going to be a, a, a single industry that you can think of that is not going to be that is not going to be affected by this. Um, I mean, another obvious one, and sorry if that if that doesn't fill your your, your criterion is. For example, healthcare. We already we already touched on yeah. that. So in healthcare, it can be things like um, you know, patient moni patient patient monitoring. For example, we have we have a great startup here in Melbourne that I've recently gotten to know. They've gone to market now. That am I allowed to mention company names or that they're, they're called Clinic Cloud. They make an internet internet connected thermometer and stethoscope. For the home care market, it's if your child is sick, it, it, it shows a mum where to put the stethoscope on a child's chest, for example, via, via, via phone up, it records heart sounds, um, it records temperatures, it can be sent to a physician, or even if you don't send it to a physician, you can show the physician when you get there. And it's sort of bridging the gap between the home and, uh, and, uh, and being in a physician's uh, consulting rooms. Now, if you extend that out to, to, to healthcare or to telehealth more generally, for example, it allows healthcare to scale. Um, I think if I remember the statistics correctly, um, if you look at the ratio of say patient, so for each thousand patients um, in Australia, for example, there are about 3.3 physicians if I remember correctly. Germany has got 3.8, so a little bit more in the US, I think it's around two and a half. Mm -hmm. in, China, in China, it's one and a half. And in India, it's 0.7 physicians. So these are figures from the World, from the World Bank per thousand patients. So there is clearly in high high population countries or in countries with high populations with potentially large healthcare markets, telehealth is a, is a way of scaling potentially the availability and access and access um, to physicians. Um, Population certainly in the West are aging very considerably. So you can think about the combination of wearables and camera systems and so on to to you know assist people in their day-to-day -day living in the in their own homes and supporting supporting uh, dignified aging, for example, and being able to live a dignified, productive life in old age is also one of these application areas where the IoT will impact. Um, in terms of other things that people don't talk about so much, for example, tourism. Is one if you look at what if you look at what Singapore is for is, is, is currently doing. Singapore has become ambitions to or has ambitions to become really the you know the smart city in the world. And Singapore is currently developing a network system called HetNet, which stands for Heterogeneous Net, and that will accommodate 
data from all sorts of devices. So if you, if as a tourist, for example, you land in Singapore and you pull out your smartphone and the first thing you get is your notification saying, hey, welcome visitor, you get free access to Wi-Fi across the whole of Singapore. And that's great if you're a visitor, but via that connection, of course, uh, Singaporean tourism authorities can, for example, track you as you, as you, as you go, go around town. So what that means is that you can uh, start to think about how you regulate visitor visitor streams as they go through the city. You can optimize transport to get you know visitors to your attractions. Um, you can organize business. You can organize business services for the, for for these visitors. And if you expand out that use case, and for example, then make these same networks available for 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 medical devices and for devices from fitness trainers, you can get a you can get an overview of what your population is doing and you can tailor services, services to them. Now that, that example in Singapore, um, w was that a, a government, uh, you know, government uh, directive yeah. or is that, it came directly from the industry? No, no, so this is, this is, this is, this is the Singaporean government having Having developed a, um, a, 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 a a smart city strategy, very forward-looking smart city strategy, and they're actively pushing into this area. And you know, for smaller countries like Singapore, it is this sort of stuff is necessary also for economic participation. Given that Singapore is from significantly space constrained, um, yeah. for example, um, you know, it, it hasn't had a manufacturing industry. It will never have a significant manufacturing industry just because of those just because of the space constraints. So what that means is you need to you need to get into other types of economic activity such as banking, which is traditionally done, services, high technology, that sort of stuff. And I mean no better way to develop and improve technologies and bring them into production than as as they say, eating your own dog food, right? And then selling that yeah. back and then selling that back out to the world. All right. That's good. Um, so a question you know, I I had a I had contact uh, with a with a company that's developing a, an IoT platform. Yeah. Um, it was really their 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 challenge was or is, you know, how do they enter a market that's already dominated by giants like uh, HP's, uh, IBM's, <laughs> GE's, and whatnot. So, you know, challenge. Uh, but you know what? What does a company that wants to enter a market, I, you know, any type of be a platform, be a, you know, sensors or whatnot, enter the market for IoT, you know, have to look out for. I I so other than answer that in terms of generalities, I I, I probably can't assist. But 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 again, we've already touched on that. It's understanding. It's first of all understanding the business model. It's understanding who your customers, what what jobs these customers have to do, what pains these customer experience these customers experience in their in 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 their lives or their jobs, and how you can create gains for them. Understanding what the market, understanding what the market around you is, and then tailoring the value proposition to it. And I think at that at that high level, that's really that's really all one can say. I mean, understand markets, understand how technology is developing, understand who your customer is, and then develop a value proposition based on that. Yeah. Find find the niche, and I think that really is all one can say to. Yeah. No. This, so these these particular people have a have a have a platform so it's like you know they'll, they'll provide say like the the back end stuff so for somebody the, else sure so in the platform in the platform business again with without knowing any details I just specifically looking at platforms I think it um, every man and his dog has an IOT platform um, at the moment there's, yeah. there's there's not a day that goes by um, when there isn't a new press release or some sort that X has created their own their own IoT yeah. platform. Um, so it's a very crowded market. But then coming back to what I just said, there again, you're probably only gonna gonna get traction in that very crowded market if you have a very very unique value proposition. And to get to that, you know, unique value proposition, just to repeat the mantra, 
know who the customer is, what their jobs yeah. are, what their pains and gains are, to see whether you can find that niche. And if you can't find that niche, then you know you should think about whether you want to enter. It. Um, sorry if I can't be any more. No, no, it, it's okay. <laughs> the only the, the only other thing that might be different is uh, you know everybody is still. Uh, experimenting with business models around IoT and around the technology. So maybe one differentiator is, and, and, and nobody has, I mean, everybody's got hypotheses, but nobody, you know, the, it's, it's, the, the world is still pretty, pretty open and everybody's experimenting with business models and that's a great leveler. Um, once people start to nail develop and nail workable business models down, then I think the market is going to stratify very rapidly in the way in which we've seen it with the internet. So there'll be, you know, IoT equivalents of Google, Facebook, Amazon, maybe some of them are the incumbents already. Amazon. Yeah, like uh, like Cisco. Right. Um, even even Google, I mean, or even Apple. <laughs> yeah, I mean... I'm so everybody, everybody who sits in who's, who sits in, if you will, the information value chain currently has interests in IoT. Those are those are those are those are hardware providers. Those are those are those are net people uh, that work around net or have businesses built around networks. So either hardware businesses or telecommunications businesses. I mean, here in Australia. You know, all the Australian tele telecoms companies have very significant in interest in that space. So, um, yeah. So now, how does a how does a in terms of organizational structure? Um, how does that change? You see, yeah, because we were saying you were you were talking about you know business model change. So that's yeah that changes things um, even at a structural level. So what? What can companies expect from a standpoint of they're experimenting with new business models for the IoT? Yeah. How does their stru organizational structure change? Well, um, oh, oh, that again is, is is trying to read the crystal balls, and I think the real answer is who knows. But that, that, <laughs> but that said, um, in as much as IoT goes across. Almost any vertical um, in terms of in terms of industry, it also go, goes across virtually every function in a company. So, I think the point there is that there isn't going to be a a single person in a company whose job it will be to drive IoT. If you think about it, if you think about the C-suite, for example. So, let's start with the CEO. The CEO really needs to understand how technologies like the Internet of Things will affect his or her business, how it will disrupt it, and, and it's the CEO's job to respond to that. As such, it's the CEO, and if the CEO comes to the decision we need to get into IoT, then it's his responsibility to take corporate ownership of this. If you are a chief operating officer, then what you can expect is that, um, and you, for example, look after a manufacturing company, then you will have the expectation that an IoT engagement will drive significant productivity and and efficiency changes, allowing you to meet your KPI. If you are the CTO, then life is really exciting because then, you know, you start to think about how you can how you how you can use these technologies to engineer new business processes and new systems, and how, can, how you can use technology to to deliver those. If you're if you're the CIO, where you have as much data available as probably as probably never before, and then it's your job to ensure ensure things like data quality, i.e., the fact that the data you collect is actually useful is actually useful to you, but uh, probably also probably also uh, privacy and 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 you know there'll be a significant cost associated with uh, so much data as well. If you're the CSO, the chief security officer, then cybersecurity becomes your concern. If you make connected cars, you don't want your customers to experience being driven off the road by a hacker. If you're medical device, medical device companies, it, it becomes a matter of life and death that you're potentially that your devices are secure. If you're if you're the general legal counsel, or if if, if you're the general counsel, then hell, you won't sleep for a couple of years because there is basically no. <laughs> 
no regulation around around the IoT at the moment, and it's pretty much a it's pretty much a legal minefield, right? And if you're if you're say the chief human resource officer, then then you can deliver outcomes such as again in a manufacturing context, for example, how can I make the manufacturing floor safer? How can I use IoT systems to to ensure that humans can, for example, safely safely collaborate with robots um, or other pieces of equipment? I, but if I do that, then it's it's not just about these outcomes. Also, there's a privacy angle to it that I need to be mindful of as a as a HR officer. And so I'll stop there, and I could go on. But the point is. IoT is going to be the collective responsibility of a whole number of functions within a business. Whereas before, you know, it's been other functions are reasonably discretized. Human resources are reasonably dis discretized from, say, what a uh, chief uh, chief operations officer does, or from what a CIO does. In the future, businesses that will get into IoT, these barriers will will break down. Okay. Now, I think the more specific question, now thinking about it, was, you know, what specific capabilities must a organization develop or adopt in order to be successful when, you know, adopting a, yeah. you know, an IoT yeah. strategy? Because these are not, these are, this is not normal. <laughs> um. Correct. It's 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 not normal. And which capabilities you need to develop really depends a little bit on the capability set that you currently have in your in your uh, in your business. So we've already touched on it for for manufacturers. What you see here in Australia, and I, I don't know about the situation in the US, but certainly here in Australia, manufacturing companies are incredibly they have. The people that are in there work in the business to keep the business ticking over. And because of their leanness, they have relatively little time to understand and react to technology disruptions that come down the road. Um, so you need to, as a business for starters, have the capacity to understand the technical term for it is absorptive capacity to understand how technology impacts the business. You need to have a digital strategy. And before you get into IT, you need to have a certain level of maturity as a business. So again, if you're a manufacturing business, for example, you want to get into IT and you don't have Wi-Fi on your manufacturing floor, probably postpone the IoT discussion and bring up the capability of your organization in, in such a way that you can you can you can, um, you can start to address that. Um, whom whom do you partner with? Um, so one of the things that we've try to understand, again, in terms of years, how, how we could assist companies um, to get into IoT. And, and the one thing that companies keep telling us is we need a network of partners around us that we can work with if we want to if we want to get into, into IoT. And we need to be able to discover, and this is the important point, capability across that network. So if, I, if I'm a CEO and I decide, OK, um, I want to. I want to go and do it, and I do an IoT project. I want to be able to pick up the phone and know whom to call to start that journey. So it's that capability, dis that capability discovery across an innovation innovation ecosystem that is absolutely important for for companies because that allows them to access skills that they don't that they don't currently have. So strategy. Understand strategy, understand business model, understand skill, and before you do all of that again, understand what it is, what the business outcomes are that you want to generate. I can just keep coming back to that point. That's good, man. Well, you know, isn't it? Isn't it? Um, it's kind of like the the CSO you mentioned them, the the chief yeah. security officer. Yeah. Now it's the job nobody wants. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's 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 right. Because I mean, these guys are certainly going to be busy for, for for months. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and absolutely, yeah. Cyber, yeah. And absolutely, cybersecurity is going to be one of those enablers. Without good, trustworthy cybersecurity privacy in place, IoT is not going to happen. Neither in an industrial nor in a nor in a Yeah. I think I think that's where it starts because. You know, there's a book called uh, Future Crimes. Yeah. You, you you read it? Heard about it? No, 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 no. 
Okay, so it's it's written by a guy who you know who did you know work worked in security at some point, and uh, but he took like a long view and said you know this is the world we're gonna live in in the future. You know, it's 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 another world because it's everything's connected, everything's hackable, everything's has information about you. You know, people who like you were saying, healthcare, uh, all these things that we have in our in our bodies, they're put in our bodies to monitor us. I mean, all these are hackable, including like the the the, the ear ear enhancers. Right. I mean, <laughs> and he has he yeah. has like an interesting story in there where somebody hacked somebody's ear thing. Or their, you know, their 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 heart monitor, and uh, you know, it's 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 unbelievable, just unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. and, and 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 here's another angle. Here's another angle on all of this, and this is something that um, sort of conversations down the down the pub over a beer with my Friday night that I have with my colleagues, and a lot of them will probably dismiss this as um, a science fiction. But <laughs> if really, if really ever we we do live in a world of of autonomous objects that that communicate with other objects, regulate their behavior, and where that behavior is not hard coded by algorithm, but rather but rather learned from machine learning, for example, we're going to arrive at a stage where we're going to have to define acceptable behaviors for machine, for machines, how machines should behave, and then of course now you're into areas such as cyber law. We're not. Definitions of acceptable behavior and social contracts, in essence, is what law is in a yeah. simplified, non-experts understanding of things. And we're going to have to define similar things for machines in the for machi machines in the future to make sure that they don't behave in undesirable ways. Oh, yeah. They have different degrees of autonomy. That oh, yeah. is an intellectually exciting and, 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 and really quite scary, quite scary thing to think about. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a topic. <laughs> that's a topic I'm very interested in myself. Um, because it's, it's like we're creating, we're creating machines in our own image. <laughs> um, you know, we should be creating machines that are are better than us, not the. Uh, but then, 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 then we're then we're also afraid because they might take over and all these things, right? But it's uh, interesting times that we live in. <laughs> yes, that 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 much is for sure. <laughs> all right, Nico. Well, I'm gonna let you go now. Uh, to Thank you very much for having me on. You have. Oh. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you very much for having me on and inviting me to to chat to you. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insights with me. Um, how, if, if somebody wants to reach you, if one of my listeners, how do they reach you? Um, if you're interested in, 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 uh, in reaching out, you can either uh, sort of ping me, ping me on Twitter, which is at Nico Adams, that's N-I-C-O-A-D-A-M-S, just all, all, all together, all, all one word, or find me, find me on LinkedIn. If you search LinkedIn for Nico Adams uh, in Melbourne, Australia, you will find me and then send me a message via LinkedIn or connect up there. Sounds awesome. All right. And I'll show that, that with my, with my listeners again, Nico, thank you so much for, uh, for joining me and sharing your insights. Uh, it's been a pleasure. You have a thank good you. day. Thank you. And you too.